We continue in this revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the things that must soon take place. Our verses are chapter 16, verses 1 through 7. I will simply read those verses for us this morning. Let us pay heed to this inerrant, infallible, holy word of God given to us for our instruction and salvation and righteousness. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple telling the seven angels, Go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth, and harmful and painful sores came upon the people who bore the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. The second angel poured out his bowl into the sea and it became like the blood of a corpse and every living thing died that was in the sea. The third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and the springs of water and they became blood. And I heard the angel in charge of the waters say, just are you, O holy one, who is and who was for you brought these judgments for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets and you have given them blood to drink. It is what they deserve. And I heard the altar saying, yes, Lord, God, the almighty, true and just are your judgments. Thus for the reading, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do come again this morning before these words of of judgment, asking that you would make clear your truth, help us to see, open our eyes, save us, sanctify us, grow us. as we come to understand more of your word and what is and what is to come. Help us, we pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So in chapter 15, we witnessed uh, with John a transition from the finality of the harvest of chapter 14 at the end of the days, if you will. And, And then we saw praise before the throne of God. Uh, And it transitioned into this prelude of the judgments, this new cycle of judgments brought about as these seven angels with their seven plagues exited the sanctuary of God, the temple of God. And these seven angels were then handed these bowls of God's wrath. And when we saw this, then we then we saw the sanctuary filled there at the end of 15, filled with the smoke from the glory of God and from his power making it so that no one could enter the throne of God, the sanctuary of God's presence, until those seven plagues of these seven angels were finished. So this morning we will look at the first three bowls of this wrath, and as we consider them, we need to mark a few things or note a few things. Uh, First from the first verse, that the one who sends these angels forth is our great triune God himself. But we also need to note from our last verse this morning, verse 7, that we hear the altar say that our Lord God Almighty's judgments are true and just. And in between those two statements, those two understandings, we need to make sure that we understand and that we know as well that our great God is a loving God who is also holy and his judgments are just. At first read, it can be difficult to assess what we are to learn from this passage other than the the facts of what our God is bringing in judgment against a world in opposition to him. But as we look more deeply, we begin to see that our Lord has prepared this fallen world. He has and continues to prepare this fallen world for what is to come because he is holy and because he is just. We begin with the fact that this is the voice of God again that tells these angels to go and pour out these bowls of wrath. This is evident from the end of chapter 15 where God has filled his holy temple. And so no one can enter this sanctuary. And for a juxtaposition, if you will, King David in Psalm 27 speaks uh, to his desire to dwell in the house of the Lord. David speaks to his desire to look into the temple, to see the beauty of the Lord 
in his sanctuary. And so again, it's important to remember the holiness of God, the perfections of our God in opposition to the fallenness of creation, the sinfulness of man. Those that struggle with the idea that God himself is the one who could send forth these angels to pour out wrath upon the world. As God has been the one who has been the executor as well of the seals and the trumpets that we read of before this. If men do not understand how a loving God can bring judgment upon this world, then they don't understand God's love. They do not understand what an infinite and eternal affront sin is to his holiness. They have not considered what Christ has done to bring an end to sin and to death and how a holy God must judge sin, must purify, must cleanse this creation to bring about a holy and sinless new creation where his people can dwell with him. And so here we are again, as we were with the seals and with the trumpets. But now what we saw as partial judgment with the seals, partial judgment with the trumpets, we are going to see in this vision as a completion of judgment, a fullness of judgment upon the world. We've also stated that as we came to the end of each uh, of the seven, the seventh seal, the seventh trumpet, it signaled in those this final judgment that comes at the end of the age first at the end of the age of israel in 70 a.d as a precursor to now what will be the end of what we call the church age today but there's another parallel that we've alluded to before we alluded to in the message from chapter 15 last week and this is again this comparison between the partial judgment that occurred in the previous judgments the seals and the trumpets, and now the completion of judgment here. What this points to is, as we have discussed, these judgments are already taking place. They're already in motion. There are events in this world that have differing results for different people. Some are brought to partial judgment. Some meet their final end in this life and then the next. Judgment is already upon the world. Again, men too often think of things like diseases and natural disasters that are a part of this world, and they think God doesn't want those things to happen. It's kind of like they're, they're simply out of God's control. He can't control what's happening. He doesn't want a tornado to happen. He doesn't want a plague to come. But what is our answer? God is sovereign. Nothing is out of God's control. The fact, there is the fact that there's common grace, but there's also the fact there's common judgment that has come because sin and death have entered the world. It rains on the just and the unjust. And sometimes rain is good for your crops. And sometimes rain brings a local flood. And devastates your fields, devastates your homes. Sometimes rain brings a worldwide flood that brings an end to an age and the beginning to another. And God is in control of it all. And his judgments are just and true against a fallen world. As we look at these judgments that come from the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls, we can see that for some, again, for some the judgment is partial. For some, the judgment is complete. For each individual sinful rebel, no matter who they are, though, the judgment is just because we have all sinned against the holy God. In fact, each of these earthly judgments, in one sense, can be considered partial as they are the, the birth pangs of the full judgment that is going to come eternally for all those who will not receive the gospel, who will not believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and repent of their sin. And God's judgment is just. Two more diversions, helpful diversions, I hope, before we look more directly at these bowls. 
The bowls are most parallel to the trumpets, the trumpet judgments, and I'm going to use Kistemacher's nomenclature, his naming of these parallels, so you can see this. I'll just give you the first. No, I'll give you all of them. So you can say, save it for later. The first trumpet, the first bowl affects the earth. The second for both affects the sea. The third for both affects the rivers and the springs. And those are the ones for this morning. And again, they're basically identical. But I will complete the list. The fourth trumpet was the sun, moon, and stars. The fourth bowl is the sun. The fifth trumpet is the pit of the abyss. The fifth bowl is the throne of the beast. The sixth for both is the Euphrates River. And then the seventh for both is the judgment of God in lightning and hail. The difference basically between those from the trumpets to the bowls is in the intensity, is in the amount of judgment, if you will. Again, which we've described as partial versus complete. But there are also differences, as you could go and read for yourself, how these judgments play out, if you will, But these judgments, again, are already in motion as we live in this world today. The message here is that if we have a more clear understanding of Revelation and not just try to put everything off into the distant future, which Revelation never calls us to do, then we will have a more clear biblical position to show our neighbor the truth of what God is already doing in this world in preliminary judgment, in birth pangs, as a means of witness concerning the eternal judgment that is coming for man. As horrible as these judgments may sound to some men, what is coming is worse. And not just in this world, but in the next for those who reject Christ. The second helpful comment then is that these bowls or plagues should also remind us of the plagues of Egypt. This is going to be important, I believe, as we consider why these bowls, why these plagues. They're not identical to the plagues of Egypt. They're not, um, they don't correspond sequentially to the plagues of Egypt, but they have an obvious reference point to God's people enslaved to Egypt to teach us from that as well. Again, God has ordained all of history for our understanding, for our learning, even the plagues in Egypt to the plagues in Revelation. The first bowl reflects the sixth plague of boils. This, both the second, but more really the third bowl, then reflects the first plague of water to blood that happened in Exodus. And I'll leave the other comparisons for when we come to them. But again, what we can say is just like God warned the Egyptians with plagues and disasters to let let my people go. Let them go and worship me as I have commanded. Just as God did that in Egypt, he's doing it, he continues to do it. He has been, he continues to do that to the world. The symbolism from scripture is clear. Men are enslaved to the world. God sends warnings. He sends preemptive judgments. God's people are freed. And those in rebellion will perish. Hear the word of the Lord. So now the first bowl. These angels have been told to pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. This phrase to pour out God's wrath is seen in the Old Testament as God's bringing judgment against nations opposed to him. Uh, We saw it in Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 8. Specifically, you also read of it in Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 25. God pours out his wrath upon the nations. But he also pours out his wrath against his own land that has rebelled against his commands, which we saw as well in Ezekiel chapter 14. And God brought his wrath through pestilence, poured out his wrath, he wrote, through pestilence, Ezekiel 14. Interestingly here, the term in Verse 2 is that the angel poured the bowl into the earth. That term there that's translated as in, it's the same term that's used in verse 3 where where we read that the bowl is poured into the sea. 
In verse 2, this bowl of wrath is poured into the earth. And so without reading too much into that simple term, there is a real sense that what comes from the earth, what men eat, what's produced from the ground, brings about or causes judgment. In any case, what results from that judgment is that harmful and painful sores come upon all men. No, it doesn't. I just misread it on purpose. Harmful and painful sores come upon the people who bore the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. And so what we have here is the declaration of God uh, that he's, he's bringing judgment not upon all man, but upon those that have rejected him and turned to the worship of false gods, the beast, his image. And so there is real encouragement here in verse 2 for the people of God. We know that this is a vision. We know that it is symbolic. Uh, but its outworking is going to be real Israel for us in whatever form it takes and how God pours this wrath out now and in the future. But those that are marked by God, as we have seen several times in Revelation now, those whom God has marked unto himself have no need to fear this bowl. This does not mean that every disease, every uh, harmful or painful sore that ever comes upon men is a judgment for taking uh, the mark of the beast, but it is foolish to think that no disease is a result of this. Instead of arguing over who is diseased because of sin, what we should be addressing from this as God's people is what a great mercy it is that we are not all afflicted with harmful and painful sores every time we sin and every time we place an idol of this world before our God because this is showing us that is what we deserve. But in Christ, we have a great mercy. And it is of the greatest mercy that we know that as God's people, we will not be visited by this particular and painful judgment here that is reserved according to God's purposes for those who take the mark and worship the beast, the image of the beast. The second angel then pours his bowl into the, into the sea <clears throat> and the sea becomes like the blood of a corpse and every living thing died that was in the sea. The second trumpet's judgment brought death to a third of the sea creatures. This bowl brings death to every living thing in the sea. <clears throat> the consensus here, when you look to those to commentators, is that this is an economic judgment. Whether one personally agrees with the assessment that this is uh, relaying an econo economic judgment, what we can agree with is that this judgment brings an end to every living thing in the sea. And then we turn to the symbolism of Revelation and we remind ourselves, what is the sea in Scripture? What has the sea noted, been noted as in this revelation? It represents the forces of chaos. It represents the nations that are opposed to God. And so here this bowl uh, we read, from the symbolism is symbolically poured or is poured symbolically into the nations that are opposed to him. The imagery is that the sea for them back then and even for us still is that the sea is a means of commerce. It was a means of transportation. It was a means of food. It was a means for one nation to rule another, for trade to happen between nations and peoples. And so God's wrath is poured into this sea, bringing death to this resource, bringing death to what can be accomplished through the use of the sea, the use of the nations. It brings death to chaos, to every living thing, ultimately in opposition to him. We should remember, again, that this would be as well the sea, the visionary sea that the beast arises from. 
Again, Revelation 13, 1, where does the beast arise from? He arrives, he arises from the nations. He arises from the sea. This is the sea we saw last time in verse 2 of chapter 15. This sea mingled with fire that was before the throne, the footstool of God. Again, we said it was another image, the sea of the enemies of God being made his footstool. And so here, when God's total final judgment comes, he's going to bring an end to these nations. He's going to bring an end to chaos, to all those that would challenge him, that would rise up to challenge him. And then the third bowl. The third bowl is poured into the rivers and springs, and they become blood. If we think of this too literally, we might just think that this is an extension of the second bowl. Make sure all the water is affected in the world uh, to bring about judgment upon mankind. But again, we need to remember the symbols that are in these visions. And that the second bowl was serving this purpose of addressing the symbol of the sea, the nation's chaos. This bowl in particular is calling us back to that plague that first plague in Egypt. This bowl is not a judgment on the nations corporately or a judgment upon their economic systems. It's a judgment that goes directly to the people who oppose and oppress God's people. The fresh water is polluted. Not the sea, but now the fresh water, the, the life giving water, the rivers and springs that bring the water that's necessary for our life. But again, not even, not even just affecting our drinking water, if you will, but the, the water that's necessary for crops, the water that's necessary for livestock. And so even in this short verse with a, with a seemingly similar concept as the second bowl, this is a far reaching judgment that affects much more than we think. At first glance, some do place this judgment still as part of this economic judgment, the effects to the world systems. Um, again, not just in the future, but today. God bringing judgment today through these means. But we can understand that this is an even greater judgment than economic as this symbolism intensifies that the, the judgment of God is not just against nations, but it's against persons. It's against individuals. It's against people who would oppress God's people. There is a corporate aspect again, but in the end, it is the personal rejection of God that brings about this particular vision, this particular bowl. And so God, we see in these first three bowls, judgment upon those who have taken the mark and worshiped the beast. Then this worked out into the world's systems to the, and to the individual people who reject God. All so that we can say there is no excuse, there is no one that is going to escape this judgment that is in opposition to him. And all opposition will be judged. But then we come to what may be the most significant aspect of this passage, which we were commenting on first. We come back to now judgment. Judgment has been a theme in Revelation, as it is really in much of Scripture, but we slide past those verses. As we come to this completion of judgment here, as we're reading through these bowls, this totality of judgment, we hear an angel declare the just judgment of God. This angel uh, proclaims the judgment of, uh, of God Upon these rivers and springs are just in verse 5. It gives us a little further insight, really, into this judgment that's coming upon these people. First, we see something that should help to inform us here how we think about our God, how we think about our triune God. As, as sometimes we skip over these things in Scripture, but this is how we come to see God more clearly as we pay attention to the words of Scripture that have been inspired, as we discussed this morning, by God. Every word matters. The angel uses what we would call a formula. He uses a phrase that we find in Revelation chapter 1, verse 4. 
We find it in uh, Revelation 1, 8. We find it in Revelation chapter 4, verse 8. We find it in Revelation chapter 11, verse 17. And we see the second part of this in Revelation 16, verse 7. And so I'll read. Basically, what we're hearing is, Our God is the Lord God Almighty, who is and who was and who is to come. And here in verse 5, Instead of the one who is to come, because he's come in judgment, this angel cries out, Holy One, who replaces the one who is to come, because he's come, the Holy One, who is and who was. And if we were going to write it, we would say, and who has already come. Again, we know this phrase. We know who is and who was and who is to come. But sometimes it's good for us to remind ourselves for our own good, even as we pray or we praise God to remember him as the one who is and who was and who is to come as we think about our great God. And so we have this eternal, this eternal now address of our Lord, this eternal, proper, praiseworthy address of God. O Holy One who is and who was. And then the angel declares God just. He's just. But why is He just? What's the reason that this angel declares that He's just? The angel states He's just because He has brought these judgments. He's just because He has brought these judgments. We spoke to this earlier, but it's important. God will allow no sin in his holy presence. This is the reason that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ came and lived the sinless life. He offered it up upon the cross as an atonement for the sins of his people so that we could be found sinless in Christ and stand before the Lord in Christ on the day of judgment. And we will live eternally with our triune God in Christ because of our Savior's sinless sacrifice. This is the only way, not because of any worth in us. And so we receive the gospel, we believe, we repent, and we live lives of of obedience because of what our Lord Jesus has done. But for those who are not in Christ, they are still spiritually dead. They are in their trespasses and sins. And we will find that either visibly or in their hearts, they are sinful rebels that have shed the blood of saints and prophets. Again, either visibly or in their hearts. And they will not be found in Christ at the judgment. And they will be found in their sin. And they will receive a just judgment. And here it's even described with this spiritual truth. The, under the umbrella of the, of the Noahic covenant. What do we find in the Noahic covenant that God declares to man? He says, uh, God states that he who sheds the, the blood of man, his blood will be shed as well. For God made man in his image. And this extends out from the physical into the spiritual truth and judgment in the end. The punishment fits the crime, if you will. God is just, and you will receive justice. Our justice was paid for, again, on the cross. Justice is still paid, even for the believer. And that's why we must be in Christ. Some people don't like the imagery here. They don't like the imagery of wrath. They don't like the imagery of death, of blood, But it is in line with what God has proclaimed from the beginning. God is warning the world of what is coming. In Isaiah chapter 49, verses 25 and 26, Isaiah 49, 25 and 26, it's a passage dealing with the restoration of Israel. God proclaims, I will contend with those who contend with you. And then he says, I will make your oppressors Eat their own flesh, and they shall be drink with their own blood as with wine. 
Then all flesh shall know that I am the Lord, your Savior and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. Some of that language, again, is symbolic. What we could say is the eternal punishment is probably much worse than anything we've ever read concerning the punishment for sin against a holy God. But we, well, again, what we can say is that this language is indicating the suffering, the ultimate death, physical and spiritual, of those who war against God and war against his people, visibly or in their hearts. Every living thing is to submit to, to the God who has created them or it. And if they do not, their judgment will be deserved for their rebellion, which is what we read at the end of verse 6. And at the end, the end of verse 6, I've got an ESV. I don't know what you have, but the language is a little bit different. The Greek phrase is a little bit different. And so for impact, let me preface what it says here. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 4, it speaks of there are some, this is the letter to Sardis, and it says there are some who are worthy to walk with the Lord dressed in white, for they have not soiled their garments. They're worthy to walk with him. In Revelation 4, verse 11, it speaks to our God declaring, Worthy are you, O Lord, and God to receive glory and honor and praise. Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 and 12, both declaring that worthy is the Lamb. One to open the seal, one uh, worthy is the lamb that was slain. If you believe those verses, that God is worthy, that there were some in Sardis who were worthy, then you must believe the end of Revelation 16, 6, that declares in the Greek, they are worthy. They are worthy of this punishment. They are worthy of this judgment. That's the word for deserve. In the Greek, they are worthy. These rebels are worthy of this just judgment. Verse 7 then in one sense simply agrees with that declaration. It's a reiteration for emphasis, if you will. But we remember also once more, it says this voice comes from the altar. And the altar is the place from where the persecuted, persecuted saints had cried out, uh, how long, actually, just let's turn to Revelation 6. We should. You should see these words. Revelation chapter 6, verse 8. And we read, no, verse 10. <laughs> Revelation 6, verse 10. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? These are the prayers that had ascended to heaven from the altar. These are the prayers that were mixed with incense. Again, the beginning of chapter 8. They were placed in a censer. They were mixed with incense. They were heard by the Lord. And then the angel took fire from the altar and placed it in the censer. And he threw that censer or bowl of fire to bring judgment with that seventh seal. Holy and true, the saints cried out in Revelation 6, verse 10, regarding our Lord. And now this voice comes from the altar saying, true and just are his judgments. We're going to hear those words again in Revelation chapter 19, verse 2. And there's a significance there as we note that that term for judgment is a verdict. It's a verdict that brings a sentence an eternal sentence from God. And God's verdict is true, and these sinners are worthy of this sentence. As we consider this truth, that they are worthy to receive this punishment, we need to remember that connection to Egypt. You're not Moses. I should have said that like Matt Chandler. You're not Moses. But there is a sense as we speak to others, that we serve the purpose of bringing this truth, bringing the truth of these bowls and these plagues of the judgment that God is going to bring upon a world 
in opposition to him and sin and rebellion. We go to the Pharaohs, we go to the Pharisees, we go to our friends and we're saying to them, a plague is coming. Plagues are already here. These things that we read of in Revelation are here. Diseases, suffering, pain. They weren't here before Adam. Adam fell and now the world is under judgment. That's why these things are here. It's not natural in the way that we think of natural sometimes. It's unnatural. It was not the way that God created the world. This is not the very good creation that God made. This is a world under subjection to judgment. And in God's mercy, they are judgments that are but a small taste of the final judgment and the eternal judgment that is to come. And mankind is being warned. And once more, I say to you, it's our responsibility to warn the world as well. By God's grace, we have heard this call and we now live in a manner that is unto the Lord. And that's that struggle that we have between the already and the, and the not yet. Our work to take dominion of this world as we were told from creation and the world's work to persecute us and shed our blood if they can, symbolically for sure and in reality when they can. But the truth is that revelation is a reality that we are to share. We are to work to share that gospel that saves men and to help people understand the truth of this revelation of Jesus. Again, not let people be deceived into thinking that's just in the future somewhere. None of this affects me. It's almost like revelation is just not, it's not necessary until we're all taken up, right? That's not the revelation. That's not the understanding of revelation at all. These things occur now because the world is under judgment. This word was given to God's people in the first century for their encouragement, for their understanding. And it continues to give truth now to us, continues to give light and encouragement for God's people until the final judgment comes. And until then, we are to continue to share the truth of a benevolent, loving, glorious, majestic, and long-suffering God who is a Savior, and He is a friend to the broken-hearted, but His long-suffering will not go on forever. And He is holy, and He is just, and He fulfills, and He will consummate His love with His people by gathering them together and bringing an end to all the opposition that is opposed to him. And he will pour out his wrath and they will be gone. And then we will sup with him in a sinless eternity in union with our God. And when that judgment comes, it will be just and it will be true. And we will praise God for it. And we can today. Amen. Let us pray.